Hi, this is a practice talk for my Sunday presentation, and um, I titled this title uh, very complicated. However, I should have titled it just The Speed of Eating. So the first thing I'd like you to think about is to classify yourself what kind of speed you have for eating. Are you someone who eats fast? That means that people are always probably telling you, you know, you should slow down. Enjoy your food. Take your time. Or are you someone who eats slow? You're the last person at the table. Everyone's finished and you're only halfway done. You savor your bites. Or you're neither of these. No one's, you never thought about this at all and you feel like you must eat at a normal pace and nobody's ever said anything to you about it. I feel I'm a normal paced eater. If you chose that you were a fast eater, or a slow eater, could you tell me right now whether you think you eat faster or slower than I do? The answer is probably no. Um, and the reason for that is you don't really know what I mean by normal pace and you don't know what the definition of normal pace is. And if you said you were a slow eater, you really are not quite sure what that means either. And so that's the difficulty in this measurement. Why should we care about that measurement at all? Why should we care about how fast or slow someone eats? Well, if you haven't heard the news, mindful eating or slowing down your eating is an uh, often prescribed treatment for obesity. And so there's tons of books out there or literature out there on mindful eating, which is the idea that you should savor your food and eat slowly instead of pushing things down your throat. In fact, I did a few Google searches, but here's an example of one where I typed in eating slowly and I got over 51 million hits uh, on, that, on that and with all kinds of treatment advice for obesity. For example, here is a blog, I think it was the third or fourth hit um, that I found that advocates the benefits of slow eating in tandem with weight loss or weight loss maintenance and they decide to, they guide us to not eat quickly because it leads to increased weight gain and lower satisfaction. Now I just showed you the difficulty in evaluating how quickly we eat. So your first question right now would be, how do people definitively know this? With 51 million hits, you should ask yourself also, why is she talking to me about this? Aren't these conclusions totally confirmed? Well, one of the things, one of the problems is how we measure things. And I already showed you that um, self-reporting your eating rates might be difficult here. However, that does appear in the literature in, in the studies that we look at. For example, here, um, there's a relationship between eating quickly and risk of diabetes. And you see that their eating rates were self-assessed using a questionnaire. The second problem is often that the data shows association but that does not mean ca causation. So in this case, uh, this is a study where people were compared uh, with lean versus people with obesity. And uh, they might eat differently. You might even videotape that and watch that in some way and make sure that one is chewing faster than the other. However, that's quite different than taking uh, someone with obesity and asking them to eat more slowly and viewing whether there's actual weight change, that there's a leap from one to the other. In fact, there's very few randomized controlled trials or RCTs on this topic. One of the RCTs that I know of was conducted by a friend of mine named Corby Martin. And what he showed, he took in lean and uh, obese participants and he determined their baseline eating rates in a laboratory setting. And then he slowed down their eating um, asking them to take bites when a bell was wrong. Um, and in, I, I think in men, there was a slight effect um, and in women there was not, or I might have the gender switched around, but the point is there was not a loud effect like you think there should be that warrants the advice that we're getting yet. Doesn't mean that can't be proved. It's just with what we have now, it's inconclusive. Then we go to the laboratory setting. Um, I do know that in the lab, people eat quite differently than they do outside the lab. And I know this because there's a 
newly developed portable newly developed portable sensor called the bite counter which is a wrist warm watch which uh, detects uh, rolling movements from your hand to your mouth you have to roll your wrist in order to put your hand and eat something towards your mouth and um, from that data alone when that uh, watch is used in a in a cafeteria in a lab setting we see quite different data than the data that we see in the um, in free living environments that people can wear this portable device outside that's not what my talk is about though um, but it is a limitation of laboratory studies and um, often laboratory studies also have the problem that they give you only one test meal or sometimes even a test um, item. I'd love to sign up for this study. This is an ice cream study. A test meal of 300 milliliters of ice cream was given. <clears throat> what I am going to talk about is th that the rate of eating is not uniform during an entire meal. There are portions of that meal where you eat very quickly and there's portions of that meal where you might not eat so quickly. And so just to say that someone eats fast or slow is very uh, oversimplifying. And this has been known for almost uh, over 100 years. How do we know this uh, in humans? Um, we actually know this first from animals, which is surprising and stunning is that all these curve shapes to a mathematician or a physicist uh, or engineer, these curve shapes look uh, will make the hair on the back of your neck go up because they all look the same. And um, how we know this in animals is that we can actually record how many times the mouse pre presses a lever to get their food or how many licks they take off of a certain food. So you can actually measure that. In humans, this is a little bit more difficult, but in the 1980s, Harry Kisilov, who is um, a, a giant in this field, he led the field actually, he invented the universal eating monitor, which you're looking at. Um, and uh, it was first used in a study in by his study in 1980. And so what um, what he sh uh, did is he put a plate on a weight uh, scale that weighs the plate. And as the person eats and takes food off that plate, the amount of grams that come off that plate are recorded. And you see this computer here recording the grams that have come off the plate. We love this as a mathematician, a physicist, or an engineer. We love this because this is a precise measurement of an eating rate or of speed of eating. Uh, much more, um, it's definitely objective, um, unlike the self-report, and um, it has a quantity that I can actually measure. The con is that to date, as far as I know, the universal eating monitor can only be applied in a laboratory setting. Um, I heard there was a development of a portable one, but again, we still have this limitation. This is what data looks like from an eating monitor. And by the way, like I mentioned before, the mouse data looks exactly the same, same kind of shape. Uh, ignore the interpolated curve that's here and just look at the data points. What the data points reflect are the amount of grams that have come off the plate per minute. You can see the plots per minute. This is the actual raw data. And what we can see from that is the initial eating phase is linear and fast. We call that gustatory stimulation. And that's that feeling that you get when you first sit down for a meal and you're hungry. But there's a point where you're going to start slowing down. Um, and this is the, it's actually something we can calculate in calculus called the inflection point. We think of it like a satiety point. And here we're starting to plateau. Um, we are seeing that the last few bites are not as much food is coming off that plate anymore. And if you have a picky eater in the house, you've seen this before, those last few bites take a while to actually um, go down. So the, the information that I show you is coming from a, a recent paper that was, I think, it was published this year already um, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, myself and my co-authors here, um, on a model to characterize those curves. So uh, here's some more curves. This is an interesting study. Uh, but it was conducted by Dr. Westerter Plantenga. And uh, what you see are different curves for different energy density foods. So um, this low energy density, um, which would be these, this curve here in the bottom, um, is the eating rate curve for someone who's eating something like akin to a banana. This medium energy density is the eating rate curve for someone who's eating something like grilled chicken. And this larger curve up here is 
high energy density, and that's something like a donut. And uh, there's three curves here because um, they changed around the composition of that high energy density. You could have a high carb, high protein, or a high fat, but it still be energy dense. That means for each gram, you have more calories in that food in comparison to the banana. I'm going to come back to this picture because of it's interesting in its own right. But what I'd like to mention is that when a mathematician, physicist, or engineer sees these curves, what we think right away is there's an underlying physical property that's governing these shapes. Otherwise, you won't get the same shapes everywhere. And that's why I said it makes kind of the hair on the back of the neck of a modeler go up because it tells us that we can do better than curve fitting here. So to give you an idea how this works, um, think of if I wanted to predict how much force is required to hit a ball out of the ballpark. One way and one fun way I can do that is by going to many, many baseball games and collecting data that I think might be associated to that ball going out of the park. The wind speed, the temperature that day, the altitude of the ballpark from sea level, the height of the ballpark from sea level, um, the height of the player, um, what type of bat they're using, whether the right-handed or left-handed, and the mass of the balls they're using. So I can think of a ton of things that might go into this model and at the end of the day I'll have a big database and I'll fit a model to that data. This is a data driven model. Another way to model this is by using Newton's second law of motion which says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. The position of that ball can be modeled and governed by that second law and the only thing that would change from place to place is the mass of the ball. And so that underlying equation gives me an equation right away. And, uh, and all the curves must satisfy that law. That's the, what I call the underlying governing principle. So I can do the same thing here. I can do a Newton's second law type model. It's not governed by that same law, but it's the same idea. And that's called the first principles model. So we did develop the model. I'm going to refer you to the paper to look at what that model looks like. What's important here is that there's three numbers in that model that govern all shapes of all types of curves. And uh, like the Newton's second law, the mass of the ball would be what controls the different trajectories um, in there. And so here, there, those three numbers turn out to be the initial eating rate, where that curve plateaus, and what we call the doubling time. If you've heard of a half-life, it's the opposite of a half-life. So here, these are the numbers that were used to fit this data, which came from Corby Martin's study that I uh, talked about earlier. And um, if I change, for example, that plateau to be 600 grams instead of what I had it before as 400, you would see the tail end of this curve go up. And that's what I mean by doesn't matter what the shape is, it's more linear looking, but I still could create that shape. If I change the initial rating, eating rate to faster rate, you see that it pushes the curve, it plateaus at the same place, but it pushes the curve out this way. So it makes it steeper at the beginning. The doubling time, which I'm not going to do here for sake of time, it changes the middle point of this curve and pushes it out. So those three numbers I can rearrange and test and ask questions. Maybe someone who's having a higher energy density food will have a different initial eating rate than someone who's eating a lower energy density food. I can now calculate these numbers and find out. So it allows me now to do the comparison that I wanted to do at the beginning of this presentation to compare across people and ask whether our eating rates are different. And really the question is, are our entire curves different? And if so, how? Let's go back to this, the low energy density versus high energy density. We can calculate those initial eating rates, the doubling time, and the, um, and the final um, the plateau for all three curves. So I put the pictures here of the different kinds of um, low energy density versus high energy density, and you can see the initial eating rate is 100 here, but it's 80 on the medium energy density and the low energy density. The doubling time is also higher. 
And the model is very sensitive to that doubling time. It's a very important number. And we see that it's higher than the other two. And the plateau is higher than the other two. Notice here that the only difference between medium energy density and low energy density is their plateaus. The other two numbers were not affected. So now we can evaluate different foods and how people react to them according to these three numbers. This point of satiety is also very, very interesting. Um, it's the period, it defines a period where we are stimulated and then sati uh, satiated. Now, when uh, investigators were first trying to model eating rate curves, it was interesting. One of the papers I had come across uh, in the 1970s uh, was hypothesizing that there, you know, because we see these curves, there must be some feedback mechanism in the gut that tells us, signals to us, that eating's got to slow down. Otherwise, if there was no such mechanism, instead of having a curve like this, wouldn't we have a straight line that goes up? And so you can actually see them mulling through this in the paper. What we know today is that feedback me mechanism is a gut hormone called CCK. And uh, there's been eating rate curve work done with, by Harry Kisseloff on CCK and release of CCK and the shape of the curve that you get as a result. And so it's very interesting now today to know that after the fact. But this point of satiety is almost like a pinpoint of re that release that you can see. What's interesting is that that pinpoint where you turn from stimulation to satiation is not independent of the other variables. How fast you eat at the beginning of the meal and how, where you plateau at is going to dictate where you inflect. And that's what this 3D curve tells us. I know 3D curves are difficult um, because we are looking at them in a, in a math class like we call Jedi math at West Point. Um, and the Jedi math students are also struggling sometimes to understand surfaces. So just to boil it down, the higher your plateau is and the higher your initial eating, or actually the lower your initial eating rate is, the higher or the longer you eat fat for a faster, faster uh, speed. So that's pretty interesting by itself and it has nothing to do with data. It's a theoretical result that came out of the model. So what can we conclude from this? Well, it's more complicated than just telling someone to eat uh, slow or don't eat fast. Instead of how fast or slow someone may need to eat, we need to measure, number one, how fast someone starts their meal. Watch, watch people now and see how fast they eat their meal at the beginning. We also need to know when they inflect. When do they reach that point of satiety when they start to turn the other way? Interestingly enough, in the paper, you'll find that we found that not all people have that point of satiety. They only have a stimulation phase. Who are those people who only have a stimulation phase? And are they different than people who have the full curve? And finally, we would like, like to know what their eating rate plateau is. So that boils down to estimating those three numbers that are in the model that I showed you. Thank you, and I'll turn it over for questions.